Right, questions, observations. You've all been here and you're living this, you're dealing with this on a daily basis. Um, give us a wave. Yes, gentlemen, tell us where you're from. Hello, I'm Peter and I'm from Furso in Caithness, which is near John O'Groats. You spent, mentioned quite a bit today about centralisation of services and mental health provision. In the parts of the world where I live, we've had a lot of health services centralised over the last number of years. For anybody who lives in the Highlands, probably the most emotive one is our maternity services, where we now have 90% of women, of which around 60% have to travel up to a 250 mile round trip. What's going to happen one day? Somebody's going to get killed. It's a fact. So that's a fact. They've had two significant advent adverse reviews. They could have had 50 of them. However, there's also issues around mental health provision what I live in KFDS. I know personally because I had to wait five years for psychological services. Right. To let me just, sorry, let just me just stop you there because we, I want to get through as many as we can. But put that to the panel. Obviously, you're not in charge of health service provision um, in these locations. But the centralization of services for your communities over there, North America, and for these islands here is a huge issue, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, um, thank you for raising that point and your personal uh, point too. It's something that links back to a point we found across the UK that people are experiencing um, remoteness as a process that's happening to them. So they're not changing anything in how they're living or working, but it, it's happening to them because of this centralization of services coupled with a reduction in transport, coupled with um, ineffective broadband. So it's, it's a layering of factors. And what we tend to do is, is compartmentalize things and different parts of the system are um, under the uh, management of different budgets. So we tend to think that they have, you know, they operate separately. But for people living with them, they don't operate separately. We don't operate in yeah. silos inside. Um, so they're, they're all meshed together, housing, transport, health, and so on. So that's why people are seeing remoteness happening to them. Um, and it's something that they're feeling they're having an increasing loss of control over. Right. So waiting five years for something is, um, I'm not diminishing your experience at all, but it's not atypical. Um, and I, I, I can only describe the five-year wait as barbaric. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the same kind of thing, the centralization of services is, is the same in your parts of the world as mm -hmm. well. We're seeing this um, across the world, right? Yeah, oh, for sure, and it, it, it's just becoming so limiting um, for the rural communities that are kind of fighting for their for their voice. When you know, uh, especially in terms of you know mental health support and and access to you know any kind of um, service in that relation, but also um, there aren't many places that would have maternity wards or other things like that. And it's getting to a point that um, women are fearful for that moment when maybe it is time to start a family, and, and it's just not feasible to live in areas sometimes when that's not an option. Yeah. Right, right. Certainly one for. But for very briefly, because I want to get I want to get as many questions as possible. Yeah. One final. Thing. One final thing. Due to the downgrade of the maternity services in Caithness, you're now getting a breeding season, and I don't mean that in a sexist fashion, because who wants to travel 250 miles to give birth in the middle of January on the A9? Right. Okay. I'll take the gentleman down here, just in front. Yes, with the hand up. Just to reply, I work for NHS Highland, and it's not about infrastructure. It's simply about staff. We cannot recruit staff to the hospital, so we need to make a risk evaluation. And it's safer for us in plenty of time to get the mother to Inverness where the specialists are to care for it. We want to employ staff at Caithness General and WIC. It's just that we can't. So we have to make the decision what's in the best interests of the expectant mother, and that's to get to Inverness. Right, thanks. I'll take that for just a, an observation on the situation there. Over here, yes, right, right on the right-hand side. That's it's Zoe. It is Zoe. Yeah, sorry, Even Zoe. at this range, I can tell it's Zoe. <laughs> Zoe from high. I hope, I'm trying to stand out. Did it work? It worked. Um, it's the red dress. It always <laughs> works. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question, um, possibly of uh, Suzanne and Rebecca, which was, um, can you give us any examples of the connection between um, social cohesion and being connected and being part of improved service delivery? It's one of the themes we're interested in today. So I just wondered if you had any examples. Right. Join it up. Social cohesion, connectivity, actually relating into what you guess yeah, something practical, actual delivery of services, making things better. Sorry. 
Yeah, I, um, I don't want to steal my thunder for this evening, Zoe, so I won't tell you. But they're not all coming to the dinner. You can. Yeah, you have to come <laughs> to dinner. Uh, but, I, you know, one of the things that I've realized in my work, working with very small communities, is people do what they have to do to keep the lights on, to keep the community running. They don't feel like they're special for that. They don't feel like they're an expert for that. They're doing the thankless work that has them up in the middle of the night. Um, and one of the things that I think has been so incredible, though, in order to deal with some of these complex challenges is to have the confidence of being resilient or being a change maker and in some ways leaning into the label of being a leader. And I, I have found, um, we found in our work at the Island Institute that the more that we can create that cohesion between communities where events like this point to all of you as leaders, all of you as the ones leading the way, what you're doing in your own communities you may feel is thankless and is quiet, um, but it's so important that these people on the ground, all of you, our colleagues in Maine, feel supported and that they can support each other. They're not alone. What they're doing is significant and they do have significant expertise in terms of solving problems. So that's one of the ways that I feel like just by making, uh, giving people a peer network, somebody that they can call that has actually shares the same lived experience or similar lived experience of having to deal with these issues, um, doesn't make you feel so alone as, as much um, and isolated. And it's, it's been huge to create that sort of colleague network for communities on the coast of Maine. Right. Rebecca. Similar to that isolation piece is so often in rural communities, you are head down working on the, the what you're trying to address. And then maybe sometimes people feel, feel that the other issues they may be passionate about aren't being addressed fully. But when you offer that connectivity piece of bringing everybody together, it's massively beneficial. So um, for example, in, throughout Nova Scotia, we've now started these community enterprise tables where you know quarterly people come together just to discuss what's going on in the local area. Because there can be somebody that you've driven past their business time and time again, but never actually gone in to hear what they're doing. So that's been something that's incredibly valuable, as well as um, for the younger generations is recognizing that they are the future. There's that connecting piece and that mentorship piece that has been really beneficial, and economic development agencies within the province have recognized that and put in a lot of programs in place to make sure that people are communicating and understanding you know, what opportunities are out there, what are people doing already, how can you get involved. That's been really valuable. Sure. I know you're bursting to get in. So a quick final point, yeah? I know Zoe didn't want to hear what I said. <laughs> no, no, she's pretty plain about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in the recharging rural research, um, uh, we had around 500 projects um, put forward to the research, and I analysed the the themes that came forward for all of those, and the number one theme was connecting people. So although the projects may have been about a whole host of different things to do with arts and crafts or sport or a whole range of things, the number one driver for it, when you said what outcome are you looking for or what problem are you trying to solve, it was about bringing people together of different ages or genders or um, uh, yeah, different interests, but it was about creating a point of connection. Right. Um, let's take a, I think you can squeeze in, the clock's ticking away, maybe a final question from the centre. We haven't visited you guys down here. If anyone there has a question? If not, we'll throw it right open. What is it about that side of the room? <laughs> yep, over there then. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joanna. Um, uh, I came here from Kyle and Lakage Community Trust. Uh, so I just have a question for, for both of you. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, what support models exist um, in your countries uh, for communities and whether you think uh, that they are sufficient for, for, for your communities? Right, short question, big answer. But in brief, what support mechanisms have you got respectively in, in, in Maine and Nova Scotia? I mean, there's a broad range depending on what your focus is, but the support mechanisms currently would be a lot, um, I think, not to focus on the negative, but we have a lot of startup support for entrepreneurs that are starting up businesses, if that's the lens that you're looking in, in terms of people using uh, business as a way to address community needs, which is where I focus most of my attentions. But there isn't always the most support for um, progression and, and developing businesses once they reach that five-year mark, like how do you sustain that? Um, so that's something that we're missing, but we have um, quite a few supports in regards to um, you know uh, hiring practices, business support. Um, and uh, we have a great regional enterprise network that offer um, kind of client support to any organization that's looking to develop in a rural region, yeah. Great stuff. Um, alas, we're going to have to leave it there, but um, and notwithstanding Sarah's, uh, Suzanne's rather, desire to uh, keep a powder driver this evening, I think you've, think you've done that. Um, and thank you both for making such a, a long journey to, to come here, and yourself, Sarah, as well. So our panel, Sarah, Rebecca, and Suzanne, give them a round of applause. Thanks very much. <laughs>